Okay, all right. Before we get into the right into the matter, uh, let's do some reminders about what DDD, Domain Driven Design, is about. Uh, domain Driven Design can be split into three axes. The first one is uh, <laughs> the strategic design axis. Uh, this one is about establishing a common understanding of the domain by defining bounded contexts and developing their ubiquitous language. It's not about code. The second axis is tactical design or tactical modeling. Uh, this one refers to the building blocks of our domain, including entities, value objects, events, and so on. The last one is architecture design. This one basically refers to the kind of architecture we are going to use inside our project. Today, in this talk, we are going to focus on the last two parts, tactical and architecture design. And of course, how it plays with API Platform 3. Last but not least, last reminder, uh, DDD is not prescriptive. There is no single way to do it. Our approach is one way among many others. You will never see two projects that build on DDD that look the same. Okay. Uh, also, it's based on our needs, on our experience. It's pragmatic. It's probably criticizable, and it's very likely to change. Uh, it's the first time we do this talk, and actually, it's very different each time we do it. Far different from the first version. Okay, uh, the difference between DDD and RID. First, DDD stands for Domain Driven Design. It's about putting the domain at the heart of software. RID is about chipping things quickly. It's useful for prototyping and simple businesses. DDD, on the contrary, is not about developing fast. However, domain-driven design can make our life way simpler when it comes to complex domains. Regarding API platform, uh, by default, it is very RID oriented. From a simple PHP data structure marked as API resource, we get a full CRUD following the REST standard. What this means is that API platform does a lot of work for us. In most cases, it's not an issue. But when we deal with complex domains, such as the one we, we have with Matthias, uh, this can lead to some issues and has a cost on the long run. Fortunately, API Platform, and especially its third version, is flexible enough to make us able to use advanced architectures and patterns, such as the hexagonal architecture. And that's what we are going to see now. OK, so thanks, Robin, for the reminders. So now, let's look at the code or rather at the directory structure. Here, you can see a classic directory structure of an API platform project. So if you ever worked with API platform before, you're a bit like at home, right? The thing is, uh, yeah, you just might have noticed the provider and processor folder, which are the new API platform three version of the data provider and data persistors. OK. so. Back, by looking at uh, this tag, uh, sorry, by looking at this directory structure, we can easily guess which tag we are using. 
At the first look, we can see that we are using a Symfony project with API platform and with Doctrine. However, it's quite harder to guess what is the core business of our application. We cannot uh, see, by looking at this folder, what our app is actually doing. Now, let's look at the directory structure of the very same application, but structured following the, the hexagonal way. The first thing that we can notice is that, okay, there is much more fast, right. But with a good ID, that doesn't imply to be uh, much slower. That's the first thing. So yeah, if we look at the first uh, folder level, uh, we can see a bookstore folder. This, in the domain-driven design world, is a bounded context. But Robin will tell you a bit more about it later in the talk. Second level of folders, we can see the application uh, folder, the domain folder, and the infrastructure uh, folder. These are representing the layers of our, um, our application. And again, Robin will tell you uh, a bit more in a minute, just the next slide, right? But the thing is, by putting things that way, with that kind of directory structure, we have put the core business back in the center of our application. Because organizing files that way, we can, as a very first look, see what our app is really doing, you know? For instance, here, just by looking at the files, we can see that our application is able to apply a discount on a book, for example. Okay? Yeah, exactly. Uh, it might seem like nothing, but actually naming and directory structure is actually a key step to put the domain back at the heart of our applications. Okay, let's get back to three layers. Uh, domain, application, and infrastructure. The first layer is the domain. The, the domain is the lowest layer of our project. It is also probably the most important as it's going to contain most of our business logic, such as our entities, or domain events, and so on. The next layer is the application layer. This one is just above the domain layer and is going to, ask to, to act as a bridge between the domain and the infrastructure. It will contain our application services, which will be about interacting with our domain in order to handle our domain use case. The last layer is the infrastructure. It's the highest layer of the layer red hexagon. This one will contain our application entrepreneurs. It is kind of the door to the outside world. And it will also contain the concrete implementations of our domain abstractions or domain services. Also, this one is very special because as it is the, 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 the highest layer, it will be able to use code from the vendors. Let me explain. These layers are just separated directories in, in which we are going to write code while following some discipline. The, the discipline consists into one rule. It's called the dependency rule. The rules say that the code written in a given layer can only depend and use code from the same layer or a lower level layer. We say that the domain is a lower level layer. Then it's the application, then it's the infrastructure. So application, the domain layer can only use code from the domain layer, nothing else. The application can use code both from itself, application layer, and the domain layer. And the infrastructure can use the code from all the other layers, and also the code from the vendors. So the infrastructure will be the only one that is going to be aware of API platform, Symfony, and maybe Doctrine. 
the main advantages of such an architecture are that the first is that we are able to preserve the integrity of our domain. Our domain is totally decoupled from the infrastructure, as it is isolated from it. So it means we are able to not cut the corners to please the need of our infrastructure. We will see that in detail later. The second big advantage is that the code is more testable. Why? Because as it is well split by nature, with some good separation of consents, the code gets a higher level of isolation and encapsulation. So it becomes way easily testable. Another big advantage is that we can postpone the technolo te some technolo technological What, does what, what that means is that we are able to model and implement all domain and even write tests for it without having decided whether we are going to use an ORM or which RDBMS we are going to use. The domain doesn't need to care about that. Last one, but not least, the domain is and can be fully agnostic to the context in which it runs. Whether the application is going to run in a terminal or in a browser or from something else, the domain logic doesn't care at all. OK, so as we've seen earlier, today we're going to deal with book. So let's say we've created a book model, uh, which is a simple PHP object. And that plain old PHP object is really uh, depending on nothing except value objects. And value objects are simple uh, PHP objects too, which are containing value, but unsured to be valid. And that's the important point. We want that every book in our application that exists uh, to be valid. We want that if we retrieve uh, a book instance at any time, uh, no matter the instance we are retrieving, we want, for example, that book to have a positive price, for example, right? So let's say that we have to expose this book through an API, through a uh, different endpoint, API platform, something like that. <laughs> so to tackle that, that issue, the first idea that we can have is just to add an API resource PHP attribute directly on top of our book class, right? Therefore, in few lines, in few seconds, uh, we have exposed our book through uh, a, CRUD, uh, a CRUD API. That's done, we can close the issue. No, I'm uh, lying. Uh, actually, uh, this approach uh, has some, some issues. First, as you can see, and if you remember what uh, Robin said previously with the dependency rule, we are in the domain here, right? And we have leaked some vendor code installed inside uh, our domain layer. So that's problematic. Uh, that doesn't fit the dependency rule. However, this is an issue that we are able to accept it. As you can see here, each vendor occurrence uh, in the file is as a PHP attribute. And PHP attributes are purely declarative. This means that even if the vendors aren't installed in your project, your domain code will still run. The PHP attributes will just behave uh, as dead code. So that's the first issue, but it's okay. However, there is a second issue, uh, which is more serious here. Actually, uh, to be able to update resources, API platform need to be able uh, to instantiate uh, those resources Partially. This means that we must update our book object in order to set uh, their property as nullable. Okay? But this is not good because we open the door to um, invalid books. By doing that, now we can have in our application uh, an instance of a book without price, for example. So what just happened there? It happened that we have updated our domain object, our model, which is the king of the application, 
just to please a third-party library, API platform, for instance. And this is bad because we want to keep at any price uh, the integrity of uh, our model uh, domain objects, our book, for instance. Exactly. Uh, having having a model, having the vendors that click into the domain is not a really an, a, a, an issue as as it's just about the dependency rule and and it's soft coupling as Mathias said. But cutting the corners and changing our business logic to please a framework is really an issue. The solution here is to split into two classes. One domain model inside the domain layer and one API resource, one API representation in the infrastructure layer, the layers that can talk to our vendors. As a side effect, this will allow us to have rich domain models by naming things according to our domain expectations, rather than having just poor domain models with no behavior, with just getter, setter, couples, that we are used to see. And actually, that's a big win. With, if, if a property has a property that if a, if a model has a property that is nullable, uh, while the domain doesn't expect it to be null, nobody knows what's actually expected. Models, domain and entities are meant to be a reference. They are meant to be the, the true. Very few know what the domain expects especially at the project growth. By writing rich domain models, we ensure that everything goes right. And that's where is the win. We don't have just ORM entities. You don't write doctrine entities. You write domain models. You write domain entities. And that's the point. Make sense? Okay, uh, we are done with the with the model parts, or most. We started modeling your domain. Now we are going to go outside of this domain layer and enter the application layer. The application layer, as a reminder, will contain all the services needed to handle our domain use cases. It will interact with the domain, or domain services, or repositories, and all domain aggregates, including entities. As another reminder, IP platform by default handles all the logic behind our operations. It handles all, finally, the business logic. In most cases, we said it, it works. But here, our business is quite complex and quite critical. We need to take back the control of that business logic. These application services will be in charge of that. They will be just behind API platform and domain, just in between. And these domain services will interact with your domain based on the needs coming from our infrastructure, passing by exposing and altering parts of the state of our system. On the, impl on the, on the implementation side, this layer is going to build in our implementation around the command pattern. The command pattern and command query pattern is a nice way to take back the control of our domain logic in a, in a structured and natural way. The, the principle is quite straightforward. The command itself 
is just a pure PHP object with no behavior. And it will just hold the values needed to handle a given use case. For one command, there is one handler. This handler will take that command and use it to handle a business use case by interacting with our domain, our domain entities, repositories, and services. The, the bus here is just a router. When provided with a command, it finds the right handler for that command, calls it, and eventually returns its result. When it comes to read use case, we are not talking about command, but queries. Okay? When it's not about altering the system, the state of a system, just exposing things for reading, we talk about queries. Now let's illustrate what we said with some use cases. The first one is about finding the cheapest books of our store. Remember, Matthias showed the, the directory structure. We are here, our business is a bookstore. So now we want to expose the cheapest books of the store. Exposing is about reading. So here is going to be a query and its handler. On the left on the slide, you can see the query. Quite simple, just takes some parameter, which is here the maximum number of books to return. And on the right on the slide, you can see the handler. The handler takes a book repository from our domain layer, a domain book repository, as dependency, and is going to use it to fetch the relevant books. Okay, great. So, if you remember well, uh, if you listened well, uh, we have seen the domain layer, we have seen the application layer. Now we'll talk about API platform because it's API platform conference, so we'll discuss about the infrastructure layer. Okay, so the, en the entry points to uh, API platform uh, are operations, okay? Uh, indeed, for each URI URL, for each route we, are, uh, we want to, to listen, we need to define an operation into the uh, API resource. Okay? And an operation is ba basically holding a configuration telling to API platform how to uh, behave when such a request is made. So here, for example, we are creating a new operation uh, that will listen to slash book slash cheapest uh, URL. And yeah, now our job is to um, is to uh, handle our use case, which is uh, finding cheapest book. And hopefully, we have before created a query uh, responsible to uh, deal with that use case. So we have to find a way whenever that operation is triggered to execute to dispatch the find cheapest book query. Hopefully, um, yeah, <laughs> sorry. Hopefully. API platform uh, comes with an, a really useful extension point for that purpose, which are providers. Indeed, providers, the role of provider is to return data according to a request and its context. And this is this fits us perfectly because we just we only need to create, let's say, a cheapest book provider that will uh, be um, responsible to dispatch the find cheapest book query and return our books. Simple as that. So, uh, as you may guess, in our application, there is not only the cheapest book provider available. So, we have to find a way to bind the query, uh, the, the operation, the slash book slash cheapest operation, uh, to the cheapest book provider and only to it. So, for example, we can decide to store the query class information inside the operation. So, we could create a new type of operation let's say a query operation, uh, that will hold the query class to be used. Um, yeah. Then, uh, when providers are scanned by API platform in order to find the one uh, who will be the first set table, the cheapest book provider will say, 
hey, I'm selectable uh, if the operation is a query operation and the related query uh, is the find cheapest book query. Okay, uh, for the one who has uh, listened to the talk uh, of Kevin before, you might say, mm, there is something strange there, why we are doing something like that? Okay, to be fair, I just lied to you a little, but it's uh, for the good reasons. <laughs> this talk part uh, of the link between operations and provider was the very same part of the talk we gave at the Symphony Life Paris uh, in 2022, so earlier that, uh, that, um, that year. And during that very conference, um, Grégoire Pinault, Kevin Douglas, Antoine Blucher, uh, Robin and myself uh, had a little discussion. And during that little, li little discussion, uh, Gre Grégoire Pinault said something really interesting. He said that most of the time, for a given operation, we are able to guess, to, to be sure which provider uh, should be used. Um, and yeah, that little discussion made API Platform a much, uh, much, much, much simpler. Because, indeed, if it's possible to know in advance which, which provider to use for a given operation, why not simply specify it directly inside the operation? And that was implemented, and that was, uh, that was uh, what you s you've seen just before. Because now we can directly specify the provider um, inside the operation, the provider class. Therefore, API Platform will no longer need to iterate over every known provider, asking them if they are selectable or not. Instead, it will just retrieve the provider directly uh, in the operation configuration. And that's a game changer for me for multiple reasons. First, it makes the, the code clearer and more logical, because it's straightforward now. But also, uh, it improves performances, because um, now the providers uh, link between operation and um, enfin, between with the operation, sorry, is not made at the runtime time during um, making iterations or so on, but directly uh, done at the compile time. So it's a huge improvement in terms of uh, performances. So yeah, great. We have linked our operation to our provider, and we know that we have to dispatch the find cheapest book query in, or in order to retrieve the book. So let's have a look of a typical query provider content. As you can see, it doesn't contain that much code, but what it contains is quite interesting. And we'll break it down together just right now, sorry. So if we go back to our little onion and its three layers. <clears throat> As Robin explained, the only layer able to be aware of the outside world is the infrastructure layer. And that's why we have put the cheapest books provider under the infrastructure layer. That's the first thing. Second thing, in order to have API platform working properly, the provider might return resources, which are the DTO representing the, the, yeah, the resource that we want, uh, we want to explain, expose, sorry. <laughs> so yeah, our provider will have to return resources so that API platform will be able to add the proper RDF context to uh, specify the correct IRIs and so on and so on, which are an infrastructure object, of course. Then we will have to really deal with uh, our use case. Okay? And this is when the query provider will uh, communicate with the application layer. I'm going to speed up. <laughs> um, by dispatching a find cheapest book query, which represents our use case of finding the cheapest book. Uh, okay, well, and of course, the result of that query are books, which are domain model. But I have said just earlier, API platform prefer to work with resources, and that's why we have to 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 have a step uh, in order to convert back the model uh, into uh, resources, to convert back the domain object. Uh, to the yeah infrastructure uh, objects. Yeah, uh, exactly. That's, that providers, providers and processors are definitely a, an infrastructure thing, as it's an API platform thing, and API platform should only deal with resources. So it's definitely resources that are needed here. Okay, so we modeled. Or domain use case, we implemented it, we 
added the glue needed in the application layer to handle it, thanks to the command pattern. And we exposed this use case through an IPA, thanks to API platform. Now let's see another use case, but this time it's about applying a discount on a given book. As you can guess, applying a discount means changing the state of the book at hand. So it's going to be a write operation. So not a query anymore, but this time a command. The command stays the same kind of object of the query seen before. Uh, this time it takes the identifier of the book for which we want to apply a discount. Also, it takes the amount of the discount. All this comes from the incoming request from the infrastructure in our API platform context. Then, just like for the query, we have the command handler. Same thing, it needs to deal with books, so it's going to take a book repository from the domain as dependency, and we can probably imagine it's going to use it to fetch the book it needs, do its stuff with it, and done. So, yeah, if you understood uh, the provider uh, mechanism, you will be able to understand really easily the provider uh, processor mechanism. So, yeah, of course, uh, when we are reading data, uh, reading application state, we are dealing with providers. Of course, the equivalent exists uh, when altering the application state, which is uh, the processor. And the, the link uh, to link a processor to an operation, we can leverage the very same mechanism uh, like we've done uh, with the provider, which is just specifying the processor class under the processor property. So now let's say we will uh, create a discount book processor. Uh, we'll just have to specify it under um, the, the post operation. Of course, and that's quite simple. Okay. About the behavior, um, the command processor will globally work the same uh, as the query providers do. Here, of course, the discount book processor will have to communicate to the outside world. That's why it's located under the infrastructure layer and deal with infrastructure objects such, such as a payload and uh, the resource. Then, like the provider did, our processor uh, need to, yeah, to handle the use case. Uh, that's why it will communicate with the application layer as well. By instantiating a command, here the discount book command, and dispatching it through the command bus. That's the first reach uh, to the application layer. Then it will reach the application la layer again in order to fetch back the updated book with the final book query, for example. And of course, API, um, yeah, of course, API platform needs to work with resources. That's why we convert back the book into a book resource. That's quite simple. Uh, that's really simple, but we are doing the hexagonal way right here. Okay, for the right use case, for the, for the read use case, now we are going to have a, a, a next use case that is a bit special. Uh, this one is about subscribing to book editions. What we want is to allow some third parties to subscribe to new books. So this is kind of secondary in our business. It's a subdomain. It's not about the bookstore itself. It's not about the books itself. It's neither worked on by the same team. It's definitely a, a specific part of our business that is less important, less critical, than the bookstore itself. What this means is that we are going to put it apart, to make it its own bounded context. Defining bounded contexts and their relationships belongs to strategic design. We mentioned that, uh, that, uh, that part at the very beginning of the conference. Uh, there are some well-known techniques to, to help that help identifying our bounded context and the interaction between them that are the bounded context canvas and context mapping pattern. Uh, but that's for 
an auto attack. Here, uh, because the subscription layer will just consist in a few code-like operations, nothing fancy, we are going to put it in its own bounding context, and this one will not build on the hexagonal architecture. Because a project doesn't need to use the same architecture for all of its bounded contexts, for all the parts of its domain. Then no, there is no need to have consistency here, uh, and one should always try to find the architecture that fits best to a given use case, to a given part of the system. For this bounded context, we are going to just use the default API platform way, the ARID way. Yes, indeed. No need for uh, hexagonal there. So in that bounded context, indeed, we decided to uh, use the ARID um, approach. And then, of course, creating a CRUD uh, is as easy as it has uh, always been. You know, you just have to add an API resource PHP attribute on top on the doctrine entity, and done. This works perfectly. Which, uh, which goes to show that RAD is not that bad too. It's just depending on the matter, just depending on the context, on the need. We just need to be pragmatic to decide which architecture uh, to use uh, for a bounded context or uh, another. That's important. Yeah, exactly. Uh, whether to use hexagonal or clean code or RAD is something that depends on the need and you need to brainstorm about it and, and, and talk about it and decide with your team whether it's worth using such architecture or not. Because it has, it, it, it led to complexity. And, but it also makes our software way more maintainable. There are cases where it makes sense, there are cases where it makes no sense. So, to summarize what we did here, we started to model and implement all domain with our main bounded context and our main entities. Then we started designing and implementing the application layer by building on the command pattern and writing a command and a query for each use case of our project. Finally, we exposed our use case through the infrastructure by creating an API thanks to API Platform 3. Okay. And also, we added a secondary bounded context that just builds on the default API Platform way, aka the ROD way. Yeah, so after the hard, hard works come the, the reward. I uh, hope you are still alive. Um, here we can see all the resources we have created during, uh, during that talk. And personally, I think that view is kind of beautiful. Why? Because whether we, deal, we have to deal with complex use casing using an hexagonal architecture, or deal with more crud and simple use cases uh, using air AD approach, the, the resource definition are the same and are quite simple, okay? Moreover, they, are, they can, they are able to coexist and to be combined in the very same API, and that's huge. And most importantly, uh, what we can see there is that we are remaining completely within the API platform framework. We do not twist it in any way, at no, uh, at no time. And this is due to the fact that API platform is extremely flexible and ex extensible, especially uh, since it's a third version. So please give it a try, it's just uh, really huge. Yes, uh, we have a, a fully fully featured uh, standard compliant interoperable API, hypermedia API that just works uh, with one bounded context that builds on the hexagonal architecture, which is great with critical code and complexity. And we have another one that builds on the already way. Both can coexist perfectly. That's fine. And we still always leverage the key features of IPR platform, such as validation, input, output, normalization, open API spec generation, and so on. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much for attending. If you need if you need help to implement this in your projects, or if you are interested to learn, to learn more about this, uh, please consider reaching at letiel.cop. We will be happy to help. And moreover, we have given uh, we have yeah. Uh, yeah created an example repository for the what we have uh, shown to you, so you can just have a look if you are interested in it. Yeah, take a look at the reference repository and enjoy the conference. Thank you for Thanks. attending. See you. Thank you.